Without any more of that, I'll just say that my topic is I am the door. I think just at first glance, most of us are pretty familiar with this as a figure of speech. We use doors all the time. Some of you are staying with members. Your hosts or hostesses have given you keys to the house. Say, come and go as you please. Sometimes they'll turn around and they'll say, well, just lock the door when you leave. And we're familiar with the themes that that introduces is that of access, invitation, maybe hospitality. Lock the door when you leave. We're familiar with the idea of security. So as a figure of speech, it's not all that difficult to understand. Sometimes these ways that we use this are kind of comical. It's like the family that was sitting around watching the news and they found out that there was an axe murder on the loose. Kids are laying on the floor in front of the television and parents say, Johnny, go get up and lock that screen door. You know, it's not going to do that much good, is it? Makes you feel better. But it's funny because we are talking about security, aren't we? And if somebody just walks in your house, you say, well, what are you doing here? I don't know you. Because they're not authorized to enter in. They say, well, there's a door and that means access. That's not all that it means, is it? I think sometimes people look at John chapter 10 and they see I am the door and that's all that they think about. And certainly when we hear I am the door, our mind starts to marshal all of these figures that we're already familiar with. Like Paul's door in the Macedonia. We start thinking about all those different things. And as responsible Bible students, it's our obligation to look into the context in which Jesus presented this figure to find out which of those apply, which of those do not apply. Or, as the case may be, how each of them applied differently. And the Lord introduced this figure with different emphasis on different aspects of it, depending on who the audience was. So we're talking about access. We're talking about invitation. We're talking about entrance, security. We're also talking about division, aren't we? A door divides certain people from others, those in your house and those out of your house inside and outside, simple concepts that children understand. When you go to a business, you might find a door that says, authorized personnel only. You know you can't go in there. You also know something about the person who comes out of that door. And so there's a division that's made by certain doors. There was a video recently, a news broadcast, uh, actually has been around for a few years. There was an FBI sting in New York, actually in New Jersey, but New York FBI agents arrived on the scene. And they're going in, it's a terror sting. I don't really know what the issue was there. But an FBI agent walked up to a gate in front of this piece of property. And there's one of these gates with the little spikes that stick up off of it. And the FBI agent, he's wearing his jacket, you know, and they're all out there doing their thing. And he tries to climb over the gate. It takes him many struggles. Apparently, he hadn't been doing his, uh, his physical workouts like he should. You could see that pretty quickly. As he's struggling to get over the gate, his foot kicks the latch of the gate. And as he's walking off, the door swings open behind him. It wasn't locked to begin with. You see something like that, and you think, well, is this guy qualified? <laughs> He had access. Access was free, but he was trying to go over it a completely different and unnecessary way, wasn't he? Well, he was qualified. He had credentials. But the validity of the question adds to the comic value at least a little bit. And there are a few of these concepts that come up when you start to study John chapters 9 and 10 together in the context in which Jesus presented this figure of speech, I am the door. Is this guy qualified is a, a question that was asked by the Jewish leaders time and time again concerning Jesus. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 23, they asked, by what authority do you do these things? Where do you get the right to, to show up here and start preaching like this? You didn't come to us. They considered themselves a clearinghouse. Similarly, in John chapter 8, verses 13, they said, thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. You know, they're questioning his integrity and his credentials. Again, in John chapter 8 and verse 25, they plainly ask the question, Who art thou? And Jesus told them, I told you. But they didn't want to hear, did they? They didn't want to see. They didn't want to know. 
Similarly, in John chapter 9 and verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. There is a division taking place between these people because of what some of them see and what some of them do not see. Sounds like there's a door involved in this. But unlike this FBI agent, there's an absurdity in, in, in asking this question about Jesus Christ. Who is he? You might remember in Matthew chapter 11, 4 and following, when Jesus interacted with some of John's disciples, he sent them back with a message saying, What have you seen? The blind received their sight. This is a reference, actually a reference to probably several passages in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 29, 18, Isaiah chapter 35, and Isaiah chapter 42. I'll let you study those on your own because we're not necessarily talking about blindness. But Jesus was fulfilling these passages, and these individuals knew what was written in the book of Isaiah. And here this man shows up, he was blind, now he sees, and yet they couldn't see that he was the Messiah fulfilling the prophecies. Well, this really brings us down to the thesis before Jesus Christ introduced this figure in John chapter 9, verses 39 through 41. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that they which see might, but which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind... You should have no sin. But now ye say, we see. Therefore your sin remains. Well, Jesus is answering the question that was asked in John chapter 8 and verse 25. And this is how he introduces the parable. Let's talk just briefly about the occasion for this parable. Back up a little bit and think about it. In John chapter 8 and verse 20 Jesus is over there in the treasury area of the temple compound. In John chapter 8 and verse 59, he's leaving that area, exiting the temple. And that brings us over into John chapter 9, how it is that there is this man that is blind outside of that area. You know the rest of the story. Jesus heals the man. But they knew of this beggar outside of the treasury. We're reading about his neighbors in John chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. And the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? They're asking each other. It's funny how they, the people always talk around this character. I just find that amusing how they, how they treat this guy. Some said this is he, and others said he is like him. And he's, he's kind of like, you ever have somebody talking about you, and you're like, I'm right here. He said... I am he. He spoke for himself. Therefore said they unto him, How are thine eyes open? So they're curious about it. They take him to the Pharisees as you continue to read on. But the condition of these things, that here is a poor man with real needs outside of the treasury of the temple. And then you had the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees in particular. Now we know about these guys. The Sadducees got pretty wealthy, and the priests got pretty wealthy in their offices. They exploited others. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 14, the Pharisees were covetous. Tells you a little bit about something of the introduction of uh, the account of Lazarus and the rich man. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 40, the scribes are said to be those who devour widows' houses. I wonder if they knew this man's name. You think they knew his name? There's a shepherd that knows the name of his sheep. But then in John chapter 9 and verse 15, it turns into an interrogation of this man. What did he do to deserve this? They asked him how he had received his sight. Now, we know the context. This was an interrogation. They responded with disbelief. He, they asked him, say, we want to know. He tells them, they said no. <laughs> they didn't want to know. John chapter 9 and verse 18, they did not believe. Then they discredited him by calling his parents. We don't want to hear what you have to say, so they called his parents. And then you have the threats. John chapter 9 and verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. People were scared to speak the truth because of the way that these individuals were treating people. 
Then in John chapter 9 and verse 24, here's what they're going to do. They're going to dictate the narrative. Here's what you need to say. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is sinner. We're going to tell you what to say. So they're going to dictate the narrative. He didn't do that. And so they reviled him. John chapter 9 and verse 28. And then they said, Thou art his disciple. And then I think this is probably central to it. In John chapter 9 and verse 30, they exhibited a failure to empathize with this man. John chapter 9 and verse 30, The man answered and said unto them, With great wisdom, by the way, why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is and yet he hath opened my eyes I was blind this morning and now I can see why can't you be happy about this and they couldn't because they were blind John chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 15 Paul writes rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep they couldn't rejoice they couldn't be happy about this this is who these guys were well, then they start with the insults. We mentioned the ones in John 9 and verse 28, but John 9 and verse 34. Dost thou teach us? You were born in sin. Why did they, why did they call him in? If they knew that he was born in sin, just a, a wretched little nasty sinner, why did they call him in and hear what he said in the first place? It's an inconsistency. And then they cast him out. John 9 and verse 34. This reminds me of the way that they treated people consistently throughout the gospel accounts. This reminds me of how they treated that woman in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, and Jesus told them, him who is without sin, cast the first stone. How many of those men do you think had been with that woman? They all left. You think they cared about her at all? Or was she just a, a tool in their, in their arrangements to get their way in whatever it was they were approaching? They didn't care about her. Jesus cared about this man. The text tells us in John 9 and verse 35 that Jesus found him. I read elsewhere about shepherds who lose a sheep and they go out and they find them. That's what Jesus did, John 9 and verse 35. But then we have the parable given. We already mentioned John chapter 9 verses 39 through 41, sort of the, the thesis for this. But then you have it given in John chapter 10 verses 1 through 6 where Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now remember, he is explaining what he has already said in John chapter 9, 39 through 41. This is an explanation of that. He's going to give this parable. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that that entereth by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. He calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Misunderstanding seems to be a hallmark trait of these individuals, doesn't it? And it's not because it's complicated. They know about doors. They know about sheep. They know about shepherds. They know about thieves. They know about robbers. You think somebody who's covetous doesn't know about robbers? Well, they know about all these things. And he speaks to them in a fairly plain figure, and they say, what's he talking about? They don't want to know. The interpretation of this parable. Jesus gives the door as an identifier of the true shepherds. 1 through 6 and then again in verse 7. Then he gives the door as an identifier of those who are the true sheep. You go in some other way and you're not a sheep. You go in some other way, you're not a shepherd. It's just as simple as that. The shepherd figure is different from the door figure. I found that some commentaries try to say that they're one and the same. I know they refer, both refer to Christ, but they're not the same figure. Jada McGarvey talks about the porter, and a lot of the commentaries try to figure out who the porter is in this thing, and that's just pressing the figure a little bit too far. The porter is, as Jada McGarvey says, he's just the drapery of the parable. I like that. Others said he's just furniture. It's just, you know, how it's outlined. I wonder sometimes if it's not there just to keep people from making an exegetical fallacy because 
Sometimes they'll say, well, a shepherd, the sheepfold didn't actually have a real door, and so the shepherd would lay in the gate, and so the shepherd is. Well, then who is the porter opening? Just picture it in your mind. The shepherd walks up to himself, taps on the shoulder. The porter comes up and shoves the shepherd out of the way, and the shepherd says, great, now I can get in. So it doesn't really fit the parable. The term that Jesus uses for parable here is not the ordinary term for parable. It's translated proverb in other passages. John 16 and verse 25, and then also in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. Generally, it's a figure of speech. In this parable, the door is the central uh, feature, and the shepherd is the central character. Not that the rest of it is unimportant. Let's talk about the background of this parable. I don't know how it is that the Jews heard this. They really claim that they didn't understand. They should have understood a lot of things. But in the presentation of this, there is something clear in the background that Jesus Christ is drawing from Psalm 118, particularly verses 20 and following, 19 and following, really. Roy Deaver says that this psalm was recited during the Feast of Tabernacles. If you're just browsing, you might take a look at John chapter 7, 14 and following and see what time of year these things took place, if it was still that time in John 9. But in Psalm 118 and verse 19, the psalmist says, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them. And I will praise the Lord, this gate of the Lord, into which the righteous shall enter. The American Standard Version says this is the gate. And he says the righteous shall enter. It says in verse 21, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. We're talking about salvation here. If you want salvation, you enter into the gate... And it's only the one that the Lord provides. There's no other way. He says in verse 22, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. How's your sight? (laughs) Interesting that crops up there, isn't it? Marvelous in our eyes. Verse 24, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. They couldn't be happy that man received his sight in John chapter 9, could they? Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us the light. Bind the sacrifice with cords. And then he goes on to talk about God and how his mercy endures forever. These passages sound familiar even if you haven't been studying the Psalms. You've been reading the book of Matthew, the book of Mark, the book of Luke, the book of John. You ought to be familiar with these things. These are messianic. And the messianic story is a story of the rejection of Jesus Christ. That's how he ended up on the cross. In Matthew chapter 21, in the correlating passages in Mark 12 and Luke 20, we have these passages referenced. Psalm 118 is referenced. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32, you have those people questioning the authority of Jesus Christ. I've already alluded to those passages. And then you have the parable of the wicked husbandman. Suddenly, these guys are able to understand his parables. He's talking about us. It wasn't nice, but he was talking about them. Then in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read the scriptures? He knew they had. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. He's quoting Psalm 118. By the way, Jesus, in the parable in John chapter 10, or the explanation of it, he says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Think about that when you're reading John, uh, Matthew chapter 21. But these people had blindness. Secondly, you have a messianic story of the entrance. You remember how it was that Jesus was entering into Jerusalem. And in John chapter 12, verses 10 through 13, you find what happens in that. You've got two people. Remember, we're talking about division and how doors identify people by division. Some people go through them. Some people come out of them. Some people aren't allowed in them. 
All of those things identify people. We're talking about division. In John 12, verse 10, the chief priests consulted they might put Lazarus to death. A man who other people loved was dead, and now he's walking on this earth with his family. You can't be happy about that. What are you going to do about it? Let's kill him. That's who they are. There was a different type of people in the area that day. And they were identified by the stone. You see in verse 12, the next day much people were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that come in the name of the Lord. Making reference to Psalm 118. Talking about the Lord there. We're talking about kingship also now, aren't we? There were some who understood, and this is the division that took place that you read about in John chapter 7, verse 40, John 9 and verse 16, and then referenced again, bracketing this section of Scripture in John chapter 10 and verse 19, how all of it is about how it was that these people behaved concerning that man that received his sight, and why it was that these things were introduced. You've got Psalm 118, again referenced in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 3 through 8 where he talks about it being a stone of stumbling, and it's identifying those who are disobedient in contrast to those that hear and believe and obey. By the way, you're talking about a royal priesthood there too. But then what do you find in Acts chapter 4 when Peter was preaching? In Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people, and elders of Israel. I've got our audience. Our audience here is the same audience that Jesus was speaking to back there in John chapter 9, isn't it? We're talking about the same people. In verse 9 he says, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. How are you going to get into Christ? What does it mean to be a Christian? What are you doing with your life? And we know who the audience is. It's the rulers. And you saw how it was they treated that man that was healed in John chapter 9. You see how it is that they treated these people in Acts chapters 4 and 5. They were blind to the good deed that was done. Jesus Christ had been preaching all over the place. They put him to death. The apostles show up and they preach. Apparently, it wasn't a secret thing done in a corner. In Acts chapter 2, a lot of people knew what was going on. The apostles heal a man, and they say, what is this about? Like, they don't know. They knew exactly what it was about. They just didn't like the answer because they were blind. And Peter says, there is one way. And if you try to live your life, accomplish your goals any other way, you have no hope. What do you long for? You long for security? You're not going to find it in your 401k. You'll find it through Jesus Christ. What is it that you're longing for in this life? Are you looking for love? Reminds me of that song, looking for love in all the wrong places. What are you looking for? You find it in Jesus Christ. You're not going to find it elsewhere. You think, if I could go out there and I could do all of these things, I could experience all the experiences, I could eat all the food, I can attend all the best parties, then I could really live. In John 10 and verse 10, Jesus promises life and life abundant. You're not going to find it outside of Jesus Christ. You're looking for liberty. You can find it in something scrawled on parchment that sits behind glass in Washington, D.C. We're not finding liberty there, are we? Are we? You find liberty through Jesus Christ. You think a door has anything to do about that? Are you looking for salvation? You know you've sinned. You've got a guilty conscience. If you think that you've never experienced guilt, you're not being honest with yourself. You're blind. You need salvation and you know it. You're only going to find it through Jesus Christ. 
But then in John chapter 10, 1 through 6, we have the giving of the parable, which we've already made reference to. And I've said that this is a parable of rejection. What is it that these people wanted when they didn't want Christ? Jesus says that those who enter in another way are thieves and robbers. The Bible says something about these kind of characters in the New Testament. You find that Judas was a thief. How did those Pharisees treat that man in John chapter 9? They care for him? It's interesting when Judas makes a big to-do about how things are being spent. The text tells us in John 12 and verse 3 that he said it not that he cared for the poor. He did not care. They didn't care about this blind man either. They were identified as thieves and robbers on the basis of their lack of care. And the fact that they didn't care about these things was at least partly what blinded them to the truth that the Messiah was standing right there before them. They were blind. What about robbers? In John chapter 18, verses 37 through 40, you find Jesus is before Pilate. Remember, we're talking about kings. He says, are you a king? Christ says, for this purpose or to this end, I came into this world. He says, yes, he is a king. He says his kingdom is not of this earth, so it's not necessarily at odds with Caesar. The Jews. Pilate says, should I release your king? They said, no, give us Barabbas. Barabbas is a robber. That's what they wanted. They continue on and they tell Pilate, you're not Caesar's friend if you let this man go. And Pilate says, behold your king. And they say, we have no king but Caesar. They were rejecting the stone. They were the builders that were in rejection of Jesus Christ. When they were doing these things, they were fulfilling what you read about in Psalm 118. And they were identifying themselves as the thieves and the robbers, the real thieves and robbers. They didn't care. They didn't love people. They didn't love truth. They were the thieves and robbers. The figure of the door to the shepherds. Jesus says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. I don't feel necessary to explain that he's not talking about the prophets. I think if you're honest and you're not blind, you can pretty easily see that. Prophets were good. They were sent by God. Who is he talking about? He's talking about people that are trying to seize the kingdom or find salvation in ways other than through Jesus Christ. I think that's fairly simple to see. This would include the Jewish leaders. You read about them in John chapter 11, 45 and following. You read about Caiaphas. And even though he didn't really totally grasp what he was saying, they thought it was a good plan. Let's kill this man. Seems like a good plan. I've got a plan. There's a perfectly good door over here, but we're going to crawl over some other way for the preservation of Israel, the salvation of Israel. It's not going to work. It didn't, did it? These people were known by their methods, John 9 and verse 22. Later on, somebody actually gave them good advice. Leave it all alone. You don't know how it's going to turn out. I'm talking about Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5, 33 through 40. He talked about Thutis and Judas of Galilee. Other people had tried to take the kingdom by force. And he says, listen, if this isn't of God, it's going to come to naught. So just leave it alone and see how it goes. They agreed. At least there was some sensibility in that. But they shouldn't have just done that. They should have said, no, this is from God because we can clearly see it. And they should have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They didn't do that. I think it's interesting after he instructs them, leave it all alone. Then they beat them for good measure, the apostles, and then let them go. Because that's who these people are. I think this would include a lot of other individuals throughout history. Maybe Antiochus Epiphanes, maybe the Maccabeans. They tried to take the king in other ways. The zealots of Jesus' own day. True shepherds really understand these things. These people that we're talking about, they were blind. But true shepherds understand things properly. In John chapter 3 and verse 10, after Jesus gives some illustrations to try to help Nicodemus understand the nature of the kingdom and the terms of entrance, he says to them, Aren't thou a master or teacher of Israel and knowest not these things? How, how do you not know this? The true shepherds have an understanding. Concerning Moses in John 3, 14 and 15, he says, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And you continue reading in verse 17 through 20, you find out that that life comes through Christ and only through Christ, and if you reject Christ, you are no partaker of that life. There is none other way. 
There is one Savior, and it's Jesus Christ. He said, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him, through Him, might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, watch it, that light is coming to the world. Jesus Christ talks about light over there in John chapter 9. He's talking about blindness, and they couldn't see the light. You only have these things, these great blessings through Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul says something almost exactly the same as what Jesus said over there in John chapter 10. He says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father, watch it, by Him. You want to know the Father, you've got to go through Jesus Christ. These people thought they knew the Father, and they rejected Jesus Christ. You read about that all through John chapter 8. We got Abraham, we got Moses, we've got the Father. We don't want you. What are you talking about? You kind of want to ask them, have you not read? There is a new and living way that was made possible by Jesus Christ. And there is no other way to receive that salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18, Paul again writes, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. They didn't know the Father. They didn't know the Son. They didn't know Moses. They didn't know Abraham. All they knew was their petty goals in this life. And they were blind to the truth that stood right there before him. The contrast today. You wonder, who were the people reading the book of John? And what were they thinking about? You read 1 John and you find some characters that were very similar. Or at least warning about characters that were very similar to the people you read about in John chapter 9. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 9-11, through 11, John says, He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness. Knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I'll put you out of the synagogue. Come tell me how it is that your eyes were opened. State the facts. You're a liar. You're born in sin. Get out of here. You think they were treating this man with love, kindness, dignity of any kind? In 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 through 23, John writes, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? These are the kind of people that are walking around. They were saying Jesus isn't the Christ. They were saying things like, He hasn't come in the flesh. Oh, He appeared to be there. You're entering in another way. You're not one of his sheep. You don't believe in Jesus. There are a lot of ways that people refuse to believe in Jesus. John talks about loving one another and he talks about Jesus Christ in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. Hereby perceive we love God because he laid down his life for us. I think Jess is going to talk to us about this, isn't he? The true shepherd, he sacrifices himself for the sheep. That's what kind of character he is. Those rulers of Israel were willing to sacrifice everybody else for their own causes. That's what kind of people they were. And the door shows us the division between these two kinds of people, doesn't it? In Matthew chapter 23, the Lord Jesus Christ announces these scribes and Pharisees. In verse, 30, uh, verse 13, he says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. We're talking about kingship. We're talking about access. We're talking about security. We're talking about all of these things in their proper place. He says, For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves. Why not? Neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. They're trying to stop other people also. He says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. We're going to go out and do some evangelism. Great, we got them in. Now we're going to see if we can get rid of them. Make ourselves look good, make ourselves feel good, however that works out. Whatever we can do. In contrast, Jesus Christ cared for the sheep. 
You can't be one of the sheep and enter another way. I think about sheep and shepherds and how it is that these things are divided up. Why are you teaching that you can be saved apart from baptism? You trying to enter in another way? You're not going through Christ. You have to hear what Christ said. Why are you teaching that it's okay to worship with mechanical instruments of music? You're trying to go in another way, aren't you? Colossians 3 and verse 17, you're not doing it through Him. That's not how you approach the Father. Why are you teaching false doctrine on things like marriage, divorce, remarriage? You're trying to go in another way. You're not entering in through the door. It's not Jesus' way. But when you're really one of God's sheep, you've entered in the right way through Jesus Christ and Him alone. You find three things. You can be saved. Jesus Christ came to save. You find that you shall go in and out. Now we're talking about liberty, aren't we? We're talking about liberty. And you find that you can have life. In John chapter 20, 30 and 31, here's what John wrote. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. What kind of person are you? Which door are you going to enter into? Jesus Christ is the only way. Thank you for your attention.